The canon divides the Eightfold Path into three sections. The first section is the discernment section, right view, right resolve. The second section is the virtue section, right speech, right action, right livelihood. And then the third is the concentration section, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. The other parts of the canon, where the Buddha lists these things in a different order. He calls them the triple training, and it's the training in heightened virtue, heightened concentration, heightened discernment. Saying that when concentration is fostered by virtue, it has great fruit, great benefit. When discernment is fostered by concentration, it has great fruit and great benefit. When the mind is trained with the discernment, it gains release. That last statement there has led many people to believe that you have to start first with the virtue, and only when your virtue is really pure, then you go to concentration. And when that's good, then you start thinking about discernment. But the fact that the Eightfold Path lists them in a different order makes an important point. That sometimes you need discernment to help with your virtue and to help with your concentration. And this became a controversial point. This is one of the distinctive features of the forest tradition when John Lee wrote his first book, which really very closely reflected the teachings he'd gotten from John Munn. He talked about how all three of the parts of the Triple Training nurture one another. When Ajahn Mahabhu wrote his first Dharma book, he called it Discernment Fosters Concentration. It was meant to be provocative. He pointed out how there are basically two types of people who meditate. Some people find that they can get their minds to settle down really easily, without much thought. And then when the mind is settled, then it can work in discernment. Other people, though, have trouble settling down. They need to think their way through the problems that keep them from settling down. They have to use their discernment first. Then they can settle down. And once the mind is settled down, then they can develop their discernment even further. The analogy he gives is cutting a tree. If a tree is standing out alone in a meadow, it's not much difficulty in cutting it down. You can cut it down in any direction you want it to go. And it's not entangled in anything else, so it's going to fall right down. If you're cutting down a tree in the forest, though, that's different. You have to figure out how to lop off this branch, lop off that branch, get a sense of where it can fall, so it doesn't simply get snagged on another tree. So I think about all three parts of the practice. They do nurture one another. And we do have a tendency to think about the meditation as being the practice. Where virtue plays a really important part. When John Swat was sometimes asked one time asked about how to carry meditation in daily life, he focused entirely on the five precepts. Because the precepts do develop qualities you need. Like the precept on speech. If you're careful about what you say, make sure that it's true and beneficial and timely. Then when the time comes to sit down and meditate, you be careful about how you talk to yourself, because talking to yourself is an important part of the concentration, directed thought and evaluation. That's your internal conversation. It's one of the factors of the first jhana. So you want to make sure that when you talk to yourself, it's true and beneficial and right for the right time and place. So there are a lot of things that might be true and beneficial right now, but this is the time to settle down. So thoughts that don't deal with settling the mind down, putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world, you put them aside. And the fact that you're following the precepts means you have to be very attentive to your intentions. Because that's what makes the difference between breaking a precept and not breaking a precept. 
and as the mind gets into concentration, you're basically firming up the intention to stay. Then, of course, the concentration turns around and helps you with the precepts. You begin to see there are areas where you're not that oh, clearly aware of what your real intention is. But as you get deeper and deeper into concentration, come out of concentration, you see the mind a lot more clearly. That helps strengthen your virtue. The fact that you're following the precepts also means you're developing three qualities that will be necessary for concentration. The first is mindfulness, the ability to keep something in mind, alertness, the ability to watch what you're doing, not daydream. And then third, ardency. You want to do it well. In other words, you have to keep your precept in mind, and then you have to watch your actions to make sure that they don't go against the precept. And if you see any tendency inside the mind to want to break the precept, you have to fight it. This is where right effort comes in. So you're developing the qualities of mindfulness, right effort, that will lead the mind into concentration. Because you're sitting here meditating when well, you need mindfulness to keep the breath in mind. Alertness to watch what you're doing, make sure the mind stays with the breath, and if it's not with the breath, then you bring in your ardency to bring it back. While you are with the breath, you're ardent to be as sensitive as possible, because the more sensitive you are to the breathing, the more comfortable it becomes. So virtue and concentration help each other this way. The same with concentration and discernment. I don't know how many times I've been asked, how strong does your concentration have to be before you can start doing discernment work? And their answer is that you're doing discernment work as you get the mind into concentration. And the two of them help each other along. The Buddha himself makes this point. He says to get the mind into, con into right concentration, you need both tranquility and insight and virtue. So there has to be a certain amount of insight into how you're fabricating your mind states, the way you talk to yourself the perceptions you use, the feelings you focus on. But see, if you don't see these things happening in the present moment, it's going to be really hard for the mind to settle down. I mean, there are some people who settle down very quickly simply by letting go of their thoughts of the day. But that kind of concentration is not really a skill, because those same people on the days when they have trouble letting go just don't know what to do. But if you're the type of person who needs to understand what's going on in the mind before the mind will be willing to let go of things, then you begin to see the way you breathe is going to be an important factor, the way you talk to yourself will be important, the images you hold in mind. When you breathe in, where is the breath coming from? Where did it start? How do you know when is a good time to start breathing in? When, how do you know when is a good time to start breathing out? You have to have certain images in mind or ideas in mind that will help you settle down. Well, those are all different forms of fabrication. As the Buddha said, when you see things in terms of fabrication, what you're intentionally doing in the present moment, whether the intention is clear or not, you're trying to make it clear. And that act of clarifying your intentions in the present moment, that's what insight is all about. So the discernment helps the concentration, and of course, concentration, as you get settled in, helps you see things in the mind that you wouldn't have seen before. The background noise begins to calm down, and things that were hidden by the background noise suddenly become clear. It's like the Webb telescope it has to get way far away from the Earth, so we can start looking at the universe in terms of the infrared because there's less interference from the warmth of the Earth. It can see a lot more than telescopes closer to the Earth. So you're trying to allow the background noise in the mind to settle down, and then things will become clearer. And again, the fact that you've been 
looking at your mind in terms of these kinds of fabrication, make you more and more inclined to dig deeper into the issue of intention. So the discernment helps the concentration, concentration helps the discernment. And of course, your discernment helps your virtue. The more clearly you understand what's going on in the mind, the more precise you can be in observing the precepts and being really harmless. So for practice to be complete, you need all three, and they help one another along. It's strange that this was a controversial issue in the early days of the forest tradition, because when you look at the canon, the canon is full of explanations of how all the different factors of the triple training help one another. There are the Buddhist instructions to Rahula. Rahula asked him how to do breath meditation, and before the Buddha gave him his breath meditation instructions. He gave him some contemplations, including the contemplation of impermanence, contemplation of the body to get past sensual desire, contemplation of the body in terms of elements, so you can begin to get a sense of distance, realizing that your body is no different from the physical elements outside. All of which are classified as discernment contemplations. Well, he said you do that first to get the mind in the right mood to settle down. We can watch the breath properly. There's another passage where the Buddha is talking about how virtue helps discernment and discernment helps virtue. In the same way that you, in the same way that your right hand washes your left hand and your left hand washes your right hand. And of course, there are the different lists in the Wings to Awakening. Sometimes discernment comes first, as in the Noble Eightfold Path, and then virtue, and then concentration. Or in the five faculties of the five strengths, so virtue comes first, then concentration, then discernment. In the seven factors for awakening, you start with mindfulness, which is getting the mind toward concentration, and then you bring in your discernment, all of which is based on virtue. There's plenty in the canon to indicate that all these things help one another. The problem was back in those days that the scholars tended to get fixated on one teaching at the expense of others. But it's good that even though the forest tradition wasn't that well versed in the canon, they got the principles right. It's because of that that we have this opportunity to practice in a way that's not too narrow. And we don't have to wait until your virtue is perfect before you can start meditating, which is what people were taught back in those days. If your virtue isn't perfect and you start meditating, you're going to go crazy, the people were warned. But your virtue is not going to get anywhere near perfect until your concentration is there, until your discernment is there. So you need these things to help one another. Our problem here in the West, though, is kind of the other way around. We tend to emphasize the concentration and the discernment, and virtue gets lost or downplayed. But it is an important part of the practice, an important part of training the mind. It's one of the reasons here at the mon monastery that we don't have people observing a vow of silence, because we want people to get practice in engaging in right speech. Treat it as part of the practice. So when you're sitting down there eating, don't just talk about anything. Talk about things that will be true and beneficial and timely. And as for the Dharma you want to discuss down there, Ask yourself, how much of that do you really know? One time early on when I was a young monk, I was sitting with another young monk and we were discussing Dharma. And at one point he said, well, I think it's like this. And John Fung happened to be walking past and he said, if you don't know, don't say anything. This is what's called guarding the truth. Asking yourself, well, how much do you really know? And if you're not 100% well, based in your knowledge, stay quiet. 
That got through a lot of the verbal pollution down around the kitchen and anywhere in the monastery. We regard it all as part of the practice. It's not that we're practicing only when we sit here together as a group or when you're off under the trees doing sitting meditation or walking meditation. The whole day is time to practice. As John Fung said, if we divide up our day into times, time to eat, time to work, time to whatever, the practice never has a chance to get timeless. We will never get to meet the timeless Dharma. So as soon as you get up in the morning, you open your eyes. Okay, it's time to practice. Even before you open your eyes, take your first conscious breath. Think thoughts of goodwill. How can you help yourself? How can you help others today? Well, one is by meditating. Focus on the breath and stay there. Learn how to engage in right effort all through the day. That way the practice becomes more complete, and when it's more complete, then all the factors can start giving their full benefits.